from six to, you know, mid thirties. That's yeah. when I started a journey to heal. And that's when I started getting therapy. That's when I started, you know, facing my demons for mm-hmm. lack of a better word. Yeah. And I didn't like, you know, what I saw yeah. in that. And I was like, okay, well, this is the beginning. Well, hello. Today I have such a treat for y'all. We have Michelle Poitier, aka Michelle Speaks, who is a healer through word, touch, and presence today here with us. Michelle, thank you for your time. Thank you for coming on. How are you today? Hi, hi, hi. First of all, I just want to say thank you so much, um, Meg, for allowing me to share this platform with you. I am honored to share the space with you and I am doing fantastic. Every day above ground, not under is a great day. Every day above ground is a fantastic day. That's very true. That's kind of the 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 foundation, the basis, right? Like, yes, right. we're enjoying our life today. Um, you know, you and I had met at a conference actually in LA about a month or so back and we just immediately connected and I loved keeping in touch with you and uh, just everything that, um, you know, you shared a little bit about your journey and I'm like, Oh, I would have loved to have you on the podcast. So thank you for coming on and thank you for being open and vulnerable and sharing, um, sharing your gift through coaching, but also sharing your, your gifts through just this podcast. So My yeah. Honor. yeah. And you're out of Jacksonville, Florida. So it's nice to be able to connect in this virtual space. Right. So um, I want to actually, we'll just like, kind of hop right into it because you said something the other day when we were talking on the phone and it really was just so powerful. And I believe this is the basis of your coaching. Um, if you, if you hide it, you can't heal it. Exactly. So yes. Talk to me about that. Talk to me about this healing process. Talk to me about your coaching, how you came to it. You know, give me the give me the 411. So, you know, that that phrase, if you hide it, you can't heal it. And, you know, everybody that I come into contact with, they're just so captivated by that phrase. Um, and it resonates mm-hmm. because I, I lived growing up in an environment, in an atmosphere that thrived on keeping things a secret. Um, mm-hmm. You know, um, what goes on in this house stays in this house. That yeah. was the premise by which I was raised. And, you know, no matter what goes on, you you just put on this mask or everything is okay. And we don't talk about certain things in the house. And coming up in that environment, because it was, a you know, we all have some dysfunction within our families. You know, mm-hmm. there, there's nobody that can escape that. However, when that is the only thing that you know, you know, that becomes your norm. And yeah. so the things that happened, you know, when I was uh, um, starting at the age of six, the things that happened that kind of shaped, you know, the way that I viewed the world, the lens through I view, how I viewed the world, um, impacted me, not in a positive way for a large portion of my life. You know, I've been on this earth, thank God, 51 years. I'm so grateful. Which you would never um, believe that looking at you when you told me that. Was, There's no way. There's no way. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But yeah, these. Well, you know, the latter it. is definitely the greater. You Good. know, my, the latter part of my life is definitely greater. Yeah. After um, you healed, we'll get to that part. But so you take all this, um, you know, childhood trauma into your adulthood. And mm-hmm. did you did you carry that weight by yourself and, and alone? So for many years, I carried it alone because I, you know, that was what was ingrained in me. You know, at six, um, I started being sexually violated by male family members and that continued. Um, And it was just compounded trauma. You know, I went on to carry that into my teenage years. And of course, you know, the body holds trauma. The body recalls and it remembers it. And when we attempt to suppress the things when they start to come up because the mind will protect itself. So, you know, you um, kind of suppress things, don't remember things. And then when those things start coming up because of whatever, you know, things, circumstances have triggered it, you don't know what to do with it. So you begin to act out. And so in my teenage years, I started acting out Mm. kind of out of character from what, you know, my family and my mom deemed was normal for me. Yeah. And, um, that's when things started really to go awry. You know, at 16, I made the first of five failed suicide attempts because I just could not handle the things and the feelings that were coming up because I got very good at masking and suppressing, you know, but our emotions are meant to be expressed, not suppressed. We've been given a full range of emotions and 
when you suppress that, it's going to manifest in some way, shape or form. Mm, yeah. And you, wow. Uh, thank you for sharing that. And, and, um, I just, I can't even imagine what you felt like you were going through at that point and, and also feeling that you were alone and you couldn't yeah. share that. I mean, that is, that is a heavy weight to carry. It is, but you know, that was my norm. You know, mm -hmm. um, I was told, you know, if you tell, you know, then I'm going to hurt your aunt and your, mm -hmm. and you know, your grandmother. So, you know, as a child, when you're told that you're going to keep the secret no matter what. Yeah. Oof. And so I carried that into my teenage years. And so I didn't even tell my mom, you know, my mom was in the military and I later joined her because I was at my grandmother's until my mom became stable. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, um, I started acting out I started drinking and, I, you know, I started being very promiscuous. Mm -hmm. I started totally acting. To I mean, I had a horrible, horrible, horrible temper. I would go from zero to a thousand. Mm -hmm. And though I was quiet, it only I, it was only one thing. You know, if you triggered me, I'm just whew, I'm this whole yeah, just person. out of control, like whew, immediately. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, my mom, of course, was looking at me like I had three heads, like, you know, who is this person and where is my child? But there was no way that I could share that with her because I was still living on that memory of what I was told. Yeah. If you share this, I'm going to harm your family. And is that and, was this person in your life still at that time? No, they were not. But there were other people in my life that had done some some things, you know, along mm -hmm. those lines. So. Mm -hmm. You know, my mom was in the military, um, so we traveled extensively. And while we were stationed overseas in Japan, which is where I graduated, I was, again, sexually assaulted by one of her co-workers. And, of course, I didn't tell her. Yeah. Because, you, you still know, had that program running. If you tell, if you don't tell, don't tell. And not just that, but you know how mama bears are. We're very protective of our cubs. And yeah. I knew my mom and I knew that if I had told, it was going to be like World War Three. Yeah. And I was in an environment that I should not have been in, um, but I was in it. Mm -hmm. um, and so I just didn't, I didn't tell. I continued to suppress it until, you know, I felt like I couldn't anymore. And I was like, well, how do I end this? So I tried to end my life and thank God I didn't, Yeah. you know, but I continued. Um, and then. I left my parent, my mom over there in Japan and I came back to the States because I wanted to separate myself from the memories and the dysfunction. I wanted to recreate myself. And so I joined the military, you know, because um, I've always had a heart to serve mm -hmm. and what better way to serve than to serve a country. Yeah. And so, you know, jumped out of the fire into the frying pan um, at my first duty station, which was Korea. I was, again, sexually assaulted by a fellow service members. So it was trauma upon trauma upon trauma. And the way that I coped was I wanted to excel at everything. I had to be the best. Mm -hmm. I wanted to succeed. And success to me was achieving all of these things. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So I was an awesome service member. You know, I was the first in everything. Mm -hmm. um, I was an awesome mother. I had to excel at everything. You know, I met and married my first I married my husband in the military. We met at my first duty station. And, mm -hmm. you know, to he represented what I never felt at home, which was safety, security, and a protector. Yeah, you were, you're attracted to this thing that you never had. So it yeah. was like, it seemed really great. You know, you're like, I've always wanted this. It's mm -hmm. here. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, physically, he was formidable, 6'4", 330 pounds, built hey, like a brick wall. You know, we ain't mad about that, you know? <laughs> right, 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 right. Um, But he had his own demons, you know, he had yeah. his own challenges. And, you know, we were very combustive um, as a couple. Um, and so, you know, the mental abuse was always there. But the physical abuse started after we got married. Mm -hmm. And I was determined to make this work because it was a covenant that I made. And I, I'm a woman of faith. So I firmly believe in, you know, the covenant of marriage. And I was like, well, it said for better or for worse. So we're going to stick in here. We're going to fight. I'm not going to give up. Mm -hmm. And it was quickly, quickly, quickly. It was very combusted. You know, he was abusive in every sense of the word, you know, physically, mentally, emotionally, sexually. And I said, you know, I am going to make this work because we have a daughter and I didn't want her to come, um, grow up in a broken household. You know, the statistics for African-Americans, you know, that 
um, children grow up in a one parent household. Um, mm-hmm. And I didn't want that. Yeah. And so, you know, it got to the point that I could no longer hide it or fight it. I had a mental break. You know, the rubber met the road while I was in the military. Um, I was diagnosed with a heart condition. Um, and they kept telling me that part of my issue was mental. And I was like, I'm not crazy because my idea of somebody having a mental health challenge was disheveled, homeless. You know, mm-hmm. um, I'm embarrassed to say that, but that was my. Yeah. And I was like, it is not me. You know, I'm in the military. I have a home. I have a husband. I'm, you know, I'm selling. I'm not mentally ill. Yeah. But I was, and I, I really did have a physical um, um, condition, but I firmly believe that because the body holds trauma, if we continue to suppress that trauma, then it's going to manifest in physical symptoms. Oh, uh, I, I, yes, I agree with that a thousand percent. I, I've experienced that too. Um, but, you know, it really, it takes a toll on your physical body, right? Yes. And, and your mentality as well. But, um, and if you don't, if you don't stop and, and yeah, if you, if you don't, you know, address it, you can't heal it. Right. Going back to, to, you know, right. your, the basis of your coaching, but you know, at what point did you realize, Oh no, this is, I need help. Yeah. So after them diagnosing me in the military, they diagnosed me with major depressive disorder, generalized anxiety disorder, panic disorder, um, com- complex post-traumatic stress. It was like, everything just shut down within me. I felt like I was damaged goods. I felt like I was no longer viable. I felt like, what good am I? You know, what you, what good am I not only to this world, but to my family and to myself? And so I just kind of shut down, you know, they started me on meds and I'm not a big proponent of meds. And, you know, I I wasn't um, honoring what they said, you know, I was taking the meds, but I was drinking with it and Mm -hmm. I was taking it haphazardly. And then I realized I can no longer do this. You know, at this point, my marriage was on the rocks. You know, we, we ended up being married 20 years before I finally had the courage to leave. Hmm. Um, but I was like, I can't do this anymore. I can't will my way through it. I can't succeed my way through it. I can't push my way through it. I can't ignore it. I have to deal with this. And that came after, you know, being homeless, um, after, you know, the last of the five failed suicide attempts and after losing a lot of significant relationships in my life, I realized, Michelle, you need help. Yeah, You can't do this by yourself anymore. You can't pretend you can't wear this mask like you're OK. Right, and carry this and weight. Like that's right. a long time to carry all that by yourself. From six to, you know, mid 30s. That's yeah. when I started a journey to heal. And that's when I started getting therapy. That's when I started, you know, facing my demons for Mm -hmm. lack of a better word. And I didn't like, you know, what I saw in that. And I was like, okay, well, this is the beginning. And it was painful and it was ugly. And there were times that I had setbacks. And, you know, this is the thing that I want to say. Healing is a journey. It's not a destination. Mm -hmm. You will have setbacks. You will have times that, you know, you feel like, you know, what's the point? Yeah. You know, you'll have you will have times where you feel like you just want to come out of your skin, um, like you're just fighting to get through the next second, you know, yeah. the next minute, the next day, the next hour, the next week. And I felt that. But I was determined that I wanted to be whole, that I wanted to be healthy, that I wanted healthy relationships, that I wanted, you know, the things that I desired in life, you know, that I wanted to be that happy go lucky girl, little girl that I remember being before all this happened. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that my paradigm shift was actually in 2013. Um, That was when I got out. I'd already been out of the military about 10 years, but I was bouncing around for those 10 years, trying to find my identity, trying to find my purpose and my passion and Mm -hmm. my reason for life. And I went on this expedition with this organization out of Colorado that helps disabled veterans reintegrate back into the community. And I had no mountaineering experience. um, But at that point in my life, I was at a point where I wanted to do anything that would give me the will to want to continue to fight. Yeah. And so um, went on this expedition, I was the only female, the only African-American out of a group of 10 veterans. Um, and we climbed the Andes Mountain in Peru, Mariposa One, at 18,000 feet. 
And the trek, you know, that 15 day journey was that 15 day journey to me regaining my life. Yeah. You know, I didn't find who Michelle was created to be yeah. and really facing the hurt and the pain. And what I realized, I faced two fears on that trip, um, on that journey. I faced my fear of the opposite sex. You know, I was surrounded by male. Yeah. Service. I mean, of course you would have that fear after all of those experiences of most of your life, you know? Yeah. And I was afraid of heights. And so I had to confront that because I was like, I am not going to be the weak link here. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, so, okay, Michelle. We're gonna climb this mountain. Yeah, and it was, it was arduous. It was, um, I was petrified because I'm surrounded by these men, and I'm walking on this cliff like it's you know this is the mountain, this is the little pathway, and then the rest is this drop off. Mm-hmm. I'm like, okay, Michelle, this is where the rubber meets the road. Either you're gonna do this or you're gonna die trying. Yeah, and that was when um, when I got to the top of that mountain. I realized, God, I don't want to die. I just don't want to carry this excruciating pain anymore by myself. Yeah, yeah. And that was the paradigm shift. That was the turnaround for me. When you realized, no, this is this is what I want. This is and it's achievable. You know, you know, you can, you can, you, you know, it's like you see the light at the end of the tunnel, but like more like at the top of this mountain. You know, you're like, I. This is what I want. This, yeah. this, not not to not be here anymore, but this is what I want. And it's amazing that you had, you know, you're decided to reach out for help, right? And you realize, hey, I can't do this by myself. Mm-hmm. And you're never meant to do that by yourself, you know? Right. That was one of the most difficult things I had ever done in my life was to actually um, allow myself to be vulnerable mm-hmm. and ask for help. Yeah. Because I had been raised up. You don't ask for help. You just put on your big girl panties, suck it up and keep it moving. Yeah. Right. And you you had taken the Enneagram test and you were at the eight and the eights especially. I mean, it's it's hard for everybody to be in, um, vulnerable, but <clears throat> eights really don't like to be invulnerable or vulnerable and invulnerability can can really drive a lot of decisions. I mean, and it stems from different things. But, you know, w- so when you have this realization of like, I want to be here, I mm-hmm. want to get help. Right. But it's going against everything that, you know, right. Don't get help. Don't get help. That's weak. Um, don't be vulnerable. That's weak. So what tell me about that, you know, walk me through even deciding to call a therapist or that first therapy appointment where you like, I'm going to do this, where you have the realization. But what did that action look like and when? So, so, <laughs> so you know, I have an acronym for trust first the greatest step was was trusting myself and trusting my intuition or my the Holy Spirit because, you know, I, I didn't trust myself because I felt responsible for the things that happened to me. And so trust, and I have an acronym for trust, it's time, respect, understanding, sacrifice, and tenacity. Mm-hmm. You know, it takes a long time to establish trust, but it can take it can be broken in a second. You know, sometimes it's irrevocable. So trusting that when I reached out to the therapist that they I could trust them with my pain, mm-hmm. with my mess. Um, and I'm going to tell you, when I went in for that appointment, I hid in the bathroom. I didn't even want to be in the waiting room because I was vulnerable. I was exposed. And people that I knew, you know, that I served with, if they saw me in that yeah. part of the hospital labeled mental health, I felt they would view that as a weakness. I yeah. felt I felt that they would view that that they couldn't trust me, they couldn't rely on me, that you know, they didn't want to be around me. Mm-hmm. And honestly, I, I I lost some friends when I came out and started publicly advocating for mental illness. Um, mm-hmm. but I just and then that first initial meeting, I was rigid, you know, I was analyzing everything. My head was on a swivel, I was analyzing the eye contact, the body language, you know. Yeah. They were constantly writing notes. And You're like, I'm what like, are you writing over there? <laughs> I'm not yeah, going to say like, anything else. I'm not going to disclose too much because I don't want, you know, this to be used again. Everything yeah. was going. But then yeah. I said, Michelle, you got to trust somebody. Hmm. And the first step to healing is to be able to accept, you know, not that you agreed with the things that happened, 
but that it happened Mm -hmm. and that there was nothing that I could have done to prevent it. And there was nothing that I did to cause it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, coming to a place of compassion because I was so hard on myself. You know, oftentimes we are so critical of ourselves, but we're so compassionate towards others and allowing others grace, but we don't allow ourselves that same grace. Mm -hmm. And so there's a method that I used to use um, when in when I started coaching, it was called the ACE method. So acceptance, compassion, and education. And so for me, going to therapy was the beginning of my journey to educating myself on what I needed and what worked for me to regain and stabilize my mental health, mm-hmm. um, which helped to stabilize every other area in my life. Because when I was off balance, when I was in crisis, you know, I lost a lot. I lost my job. I lost a significant relationship. I lost my um, home. You know, I lost my car. Um, I lost the, the support of my family because they didn't know how to help me. Yeah. And I didn't know how to tell them to help me because I didn't know what was wrong. Right. Right. Yeah. If if you can't heal it, if you don't know what it is, if you hide it, you right. know, and, and as you're unpacking it, you got to figure out, you know, what what exactly is this? Because, you know, there's a root cause. And mm-hmm. then I think a lot of the symptoms come up and, and the symptoms can look very blatant, right? Anger mm-hmm. or, you know, emotions or habits and patterns. And they're very easy to see. So you treat the symptom. And, and, you don't deal with the root. and it's not, yeah. And if you don't deal with the root, it's you're never going to heal any of the symptoms. The symptoms are going to they're going to come back, and they're going to be exasperated, and they're going to you know you're going to hurt people that have never hurt you, people that are trying to help you. Mm-hmm. And so that's what I did for a long time. Like you know, I wouldn't allow anybody close. If they got close, they would only get to a certain point. Yeah, because you didn't and trust. Then I was sabotaging, you know, the yeah. relationships. Um, yeah, I'd sabotage, you know opportunities, I would sabotage everything because you're not going to get in so close that you're in a position to hurt me. Yeah. Yeah. To, to, like a know, barrier. I didn't want to backtrack from all the, the progress that I've made. Mm-hmm. And so um, it was challenging, but it was, it wor- was it worth it? Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, is the journey complete? No, because there's levels and layers of feeling like I'm still on the journey. I let people know all the time. I have not arrived, you know, and that's the thing that you have to come to realization with because there's layers. Mm-hmm. You only you can only treat what you know. Yeah. You can only treat what's revealed. You can only treat what's triggered by a circumstance or a certain situation that reminded you of the original, mm-hmm. the root the of root. what it was that caused you, Yeah, you know, to see life through the lens that you're seeing it, which is skewed. Mm-hmm. Well, and, and I think you what you said about layers is is interesting because, you know, allowing yourself to also heal one layer at a time. You know, mm-hmm. I I I have experienced this myself, and I see it a lot in coaching where it's like, again, going back to compassion, uh, compassion yeah. for you know what has happened in the past, um, but also compassion for your rate at which you're you're healing where people mm-hmm. are like i i already I, I thought i already healed this you know and you said you, you, yeah. you backtrack in a little bit and that's okay it's part of the journey and mm-hmm. to not say oh let me give up on everything just because i backtracked or oh my gosh i healed this one you know layer of the onion but mm-hmm. oh my gosh now there's another one and when is this gonna stop you know and being mad at yourself for discovering more as you grow It's like that compassion and grace for yourself. I I love that you brought that up. Yeah. I mean, and, you know, this is the thing. The key is having a community of support, Mm -hmm. um, having somebody to be accountable outside of yourself and outside of your relationship with, you know, for me, my humble father, but whatever spiritual, you know, um, entity that you ascribe to, you have to have a community of support because you cannot do it alone. Mm. You have to be able to allow somebody to be able to speak into your life that you trust because we all have blind spots. Yeah. I'm going to let you know that you're off. Hey, you're, you're going to the left here. What's going on with you? Yeah. Um, and so that was key, crucial for me. But I vowed that I would always be transparent, vulnerable 
accountable and authentic, no matter what the cost was. Mm -hmm. Once I got to that place of peace and healing, a level of healing where I could, you know, breathe and show up authentically, unapologetically, I was like, I am not going back for anybody. Yeah. Um, And so that was key for me to the point that there was one point in time a couple of years ago that I, I self admitted myself, you know, to get some psychological care because I was encountering some things that triggered me so bad that I knew that I couldn't handle it on my own. So Mm -hmm. I was like, I need to get some help. Yeah. But that's, that's even growth in itself because, you know, when you, you went from, I don't want help at all. I don't want help at all. I don't want help at all. I don't even want to talk about it. I don't want to think about it. I want to hide it even from myself, you know, Mm -hmm. and to initially getting help. And then, so that's like a big growth, you know, growth jump leap, you know, whatever you want to call it. But then also like later on, even in that journey, it's, that shows even more growth of like, no, I know I need more. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, that's awesome to see, you know, and, where you're like, I'm not hiding this anymore. You know, it's like when you, you don't, you you get to this point, did you ever get to this point where you said, I don't want to ever hide this ever again, you know? Yes, I'm at that point now. Mm -hmm. You know, I just let it all, you know, let it all hang out, you know, knowing that some people can't handle your stuff. So Mm -hmm. that's where the intuition and the Holy Spirit comes in. And it it guides me on how much I share with who and who Mm -hmm. I will allow in that I feel safe, that Mm -hmm. is not going to, cause me to backtrack or be detrimental to me. Yeah. And so, you know, there's three categories of people in my life. There are those that are in the outer court. Those are the, that are in the inner court and those that are in the holiest of holies. So, you know, if you get in that holiest of holies, you best believe you've been vetted. Yeah. Yeah. You're in it. <laughs> you're, you're in it. We're in this, you know, yeah. uh, ride or die. Yeah. Um, but I've learned to trust my, my instincts. I've learned to trust that inner voice because mm-hmm. I've I've been dealing with the imbalances and the voids that were left within my soul because of the trauma that I experienced. Mm-hmm. And that's the thing people don't want to talk about. You know, um, you got to deal with the most painful things that you don't want to deal with, the pain points in our life, because society has brainwashed us into pursuing pleasure mm-hmm. and avoiding pain. But pain is a part of the process of life and pain is the thing that causes us to pivot and change things in our lives that need to be changed, you know, and I really tapped into finding out who Michelle was. I'm creative, you know, some Mm -hmm. of our most creative entertainers and artists have challenges with mental health. And so, you know, I, I, Michelle, I was like, Michelle, what can I do? What can you do to get this out? So I started writing, you know, and now five books later. Wow. Um, mm-hmm. You know, so it helped me to find out what my passion was. Yeah. That passion pushed me into purpose. That purpose pushed me into power. And now I go back and help others find their power. Mm-hmm. That's but awesome. am I still on the journey? Yes. Right. There's no there's no summit to personal growth, you know. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure even on your 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 trek, your your 15 day hike, you likely learned more about yourself every single one of those 15 days than you did at the the moment you spent at the top. You know, it was beautiful and you appreciated that. But Mm -hmm. those 15 days is where everything started to. And and, it was life changing. mm -hmm. It was so life changing. Just, you know, nature has a healing quality that nothing else can mimic. And I fell in love. I always loved the outdoors, but I fell in love with the outdoors in a way that I had never had before. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I went back, you know, and ended up becoming one of their leaders for their, for their projects. So, you know, I ended up learning how to repel and rock climb, you know, not, not a wall, but the real deal. Yeah. I fell, I, I fell in love. I have a love for, for not just hiking, but climbing, like real climbing, you know, with the rocks and the ice picks and being roped in to your rope team and trusting them. That's a lot of trust there. Yeah. I just love adventure. Mm-hmm. Um, and I love, I'm connected to nature. I'm connected to outdoors. I tapped into um, connecting the mind, body, and spirit mm-hmm. because if one is out of alignment and everything else is. Yeah. Yeah. And I realized that I need nature. I need people. 
Um, I need to be able to trust someone other than myself because the root word of community is commune. It is hardwired within our DNA to connect or mm-hmm. connection. And if we are not able to connect, then we need to go back and find the disconnect, you mm-hmm. know, in our life to be able to reconnect. And yeah. so I do that with what I do. You know, what I, I tell people, if you're disconnected, there's three areas that you need to look at your connection with the creator your connection with yourself, and then your connection with your friends, family, and loved ones. And if there's a disconnect, then that's where you need to begin. Mm -hmm. Because Mm -hmm. mental wellness governs everything else. Like our finances, our our social, our environmental, our mental, our emotional, our relational. Mm -hmm. If you're disconnected, then there's something that needs to be addressed in your mental wellness. And if you you don't make that connection, right? If you stay disconnected... um, it's, it's a lot easier to just ignore, right? Mm-hmm. And ignoring can look like cutting people off, you know, and, and just, I don't want to deal with this. So let me just avoid this person or just, you know, cut them out of my life. And it could mm-hmm. also, you know, even within yourself, it just looks like kind of, you know, where everything's just kind of gray, right? And mm-hmm. it's like, black and white is like a little blurry and just nothing's in like full bright color and you yeah. you live your life that way for a long time I describe it as a sleep you know you're kind of like walking around sleepwalking because you're not yeah. you're not your full self right because you know I I was unhealed for a very long time you know I um I don't know if I shared this with you I, I may have um but when I was 23, the man I was going to marry, he was in the Marines and he was killed in Afghanistan. Mm-hmm. And I went into drinking, went into um, prescription medication, mixing the two of them mm-hmm. and just, I mean, antidepressants on top of that, too. And just I, I didn't want to deal with it. Right. Mm-hmm. It went unhealed for years, Mm -hmm. about nine years before I even Mm -hmm. faced it. And during that time that I was unhealed, I'm not saying I'm fully healed now, but but when I was in denial that I needed healing, essentially, um, I got married. I moved to Texas. I got divorced. And Mm -hmm. then it, it was even another year after that where it took me like, hey, this is not what your life is really meant for. Right. And, and you, right. you kind of wake up in your own life and you're like, Whoa, I've been asleep for, you know, X amount of years. And it's, it's eye opening, and it's, it was hard, you know, yeah. and parts felt involuntary, <laughs> you know, where it's like something inside of you saying, Hey, you got to do this. And yeah. you, you, know, you say, Hey, yes, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to work on this, right? Mm-hmm. I'm going to stay in this little messy area. And um, the mess becomes the message. Mm-hmm. You know, that's, yeah. That's what, that's what started me wanting to help others heal. Because once I realized how liberating it was for me, yeah, um, I said, I can't keep this, you know? And the thing that helped me was I finally felt safe. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the thing that a lot of people are lacking. They're lacking a place where they feel safe. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Even within themselves. And yeah. if you can't feel safe within yourself, you're not going to feel safe with anyone or anybody. No. And you can you can walk around fronting it, right? If if anybody knew, or people who didn't know about my situation, you know, I moved to Texas and basically had this whole new brand new life. Um, I was the happiest person ever, right? You would never be able to... I, you know, don't, yes. don't bog me down. Like I'm Miss positive over here, you know, optimism. Yay. But, and nobody ever knew. And mm-hmm. until I would tell them and it was like, what, you know, but I look back and I, you know, fully feel alive in my own self now. Mm-hmm. But I look back on those nine years. I'm like, I don't even know who that person was, Yeah, you know, and it's just amazing. And I guess you don't see it until you're on the other side of it. Yeah. You know, you, yeah. And I'm trying to think of like the yeah. advice I would have told myself, you know, now looking back on that version that wasn't myself. And I'm just, I don't know. What would you have told yourself looking back? Well, I would have told myself when I was looking at that mirror at that stranger that I no longer recognize mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that it's okay. It's okay for you to show up. You're safe. I love you. I love you Mm -hmm. and you are loved. You are worthy. You are important. You're not alone and you matter. Mm -hmm. 
That's what I would have told myself um, because we wear these masks, you know, and there's a, I wrote a, a poem called Beneath the Mask because once I took that mask off, I realized how many other people that I see walking around every day that are wearing it. It doesn't matter yeah. what their title is. Yeah, yeah. And so I, I'd love to share it very briefly. Yeah, yeah please do. Yeah, so sure. it's called Beneath the Mask. Can you see beneath the mask? Do you see the pain that's concealed? Afraid to reveal how I truly feel. Day in, day out, I strive to appear strong, confident, and in control. But in reality, there is a war raging within my soul. So many times you look and only see the surface. But who will take the time to look beyond and see my true purpose? Who will take the time to look at the gift that they can have being in my presence? I see the pain beneath the names of others in the world today, how you may ask. I see what once was reflected in me. Many are starving for that thing we all crave, acceptance, love, and affection. Often the world offers exactly the opposite, apathy, hate, and rejection. But there is a place where the mask can be removed, a place where you can be free. Are you brave enough to unveil? And allow others to see beneath the mask. This is that place, you know, let's create your life is that place. Michelle speaks is that place. And there's many other places where you can unveil and reveal and begin the journey to healing and being your authentic self unapologetically. So remove the mask, you know, unmask, unveil the hurt that's within to nurture the longing that's within to manifest your dreams, goals, and desires, to truly come alive, to be safe to be you, and to attract the kindred connections that were already preordained for you before you even came into this world. So unmask, the time is now. Yeah. That's beautiful. Wow. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. You can tell it that came a- from your soul. It <laughs> you did. You can tell. <laughs> That's just, Wow. And, and you're, I mean, it speaks such truth. Um, there's so many people walking around thinking that they can't heal, right? Yeah. That it's, I think the biggest thing that you said was just compassion for yourself, right? Mm-hmm. Where, I mean, yes, the, the acceptance of this happened and it wasn't my fault. And, mm-hmm. um, but compassion for yourself when you weren't your best self because of it too, you know, Mm -hmm. self-forgiveness, Yeah, you know, and that's, that's a big, that's a big thing that it took me, uh, you know, some time to, because I did a lot of really crappy things um, when I was Mm -hmm. a very unhealed person and things where you're like, what, who, Mm -hmm. like, who are you, you know? And it, it took a while, you know, I carried the guilt around and the shame, Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, With that around for a long time when I before I said, hey, I forgive myself for this, Mm -hmm. you know, you know, forgiving others is easy. Self-forgiveness is one of the hardest things. Mm -hmm. You know, I I literally left myself last when I was looking for forgiveness. I forgave all of the males in my family that violated me. I forgave my ex-husband. It took me seven years mm-hmm. after we got divorced. <laughs> yeah. You know, he's in prison now. That's a whole other story. We'll get, um, you, we'll get you back on the podcast for that one. <laughs> but forgiving myself, I had to practice it daily. And I would stand in the mirror. I choose daily to forgive you, Michelle. Yes. Um, yeah. I choose daily to forgive those that harmed me. Mm-hmm. And I choose daily to be reduced to love. Like I want to I want to go beyond forgiving those that harm me. I want to love them past that where I don't even recall it anymore. Yeah. But forgiving myself, even now, you know, um, I'm not going to go into detail, but I'm going through a personal challenge now where I really had to have to utilize the tools that I help others. Like this is not something that I just do. This is something that I live and walk out daily. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, You know, and so I'm walking in that space now every day. Michelle, you're human. Forgive yourself. 
you've forgiven them, forgive yourself. And mm-hmm. so that's a way of restoring my voice. Yeah. You know, because that's what that's what trauma does. It steals our voice before we even realize we have it, a voice. So mm-hmm. that's what I do. I help people to identify the barriers to healing. Yeah. To end the shame of silence, you know, by cleansing false belief systems because everything is rooted and grounded in our core beliefs. Yeah. And then to end to restore their voice by setting and sustaining healthy boundaries. Wow. That's awesome. Uh, that's, I mean, I feel like everybody needs this, you know? <laughs> um, so when you, when you work with a client or what have you seen over your, your years of coaching, why do most people feel like they have to hide their, their trauma or their, their, you know, mess or um, whatever they're not wanting to, to face? Because they're carrying the burden of the guilt and the shame that was attached to whatever caused them Mm -hmm. to feel unseen. Mm -hmm. You know, the thing that drives mankind, I believe, is we want to give and receive love. We want to be seen and we want to be heard. And because of whatever trauma or compounded trauma happened to them, they became invisible and their voice was taken. And there's the burden and the guilt and the shame of like, why didn't I protect myself? Why didn't I see that? Why didn't I fight back? Why didn't I, you know, why did I just allow it to happen? Mm -hmm. But you didn't allow it to happen. You know, it it was something that you couldn't have foreseen. So that's what I see a lot. Um, And it causes them to lose their identity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if you don't have an identity, then how would you even have a voice to speak from? You know, exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And so guilt and shame are the other things that seem to be resonant, are resonant, are resounding. Mm-hmm. pattern yeah um, that I see and then helping them to you know because I don't do it for them yeah I just help them to you know find their way back and use the tools to identify it themselves yeah and just share the journey with them that's all we want we want to be able to so this is the vision to help people overcome pain based on a foundation of faith to heal in a safe place in love. Mm-hmm. And that's what we all want. We want love. Yeah. We were created for it. Yeah. No, I, I, I agree. Um, that's, that's what, that's what you want. And, um, it starts with loving yourself, you know, mm-hmm. and with love is attached to the word forgiveness, right? Mm-hmm. It's one and the same. Um, mm-hmm. but, that's that seems like a really great place to start, right? Because I know there's a lot of people out there who don't even know where to start. You know, I don't even, don't know. even know how to love themselves. Mm-hmm. So how can you, you how can you love yourself if you don't know what love is, mm-hmm. what loving yourself looks like? Right. Loving yourself is knowing what you like. Loving yourself is knowing that you're worthy enough to have boundaries. Loving yourself is knowing that you're you're. You, knowing yourself and know, to know that you can take up space, mm-hmm. uh, being comfortable in your skin. Yeah. You yeah. know, like, I know who I am. I know what Michelle likes. I know what I don't like. I know what I will stand for. I know what I won't tolerate. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't have to be loud in there because loud is not always strength. Mm-hmm. You know, oftentimes loud is insecurity. Yeah. Not all the time, but sometimes. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, um, that's my goal was to help people restore their voice. Mm-hmm. That's amazing. And to know that they're, they are worthy and they're not alone despite the things that they've encountered. Mm-hmm. And that there is life after trauma, life after abuse, life after whatever it is that you encountered yeah. that makes you feel insignificant. Right. But you got you to gotta start to face it because mm-hmm. otherwise it's just going to continue to go and go and go and go. Um, I, there's this quote that it says if you if you don't allow something to live then it can never die mm-hmm. and if you just keep everything hidden and never address you know the shame and guilt that i felt if you never give life to that to take a look at it then mm-hmm. it can never die and you're yeah. just carry it around with you you know forever and and i think a lot of people i think i think loving yourself looks like being able to change your mind too where you know it's not like one of these things where, well, I've, I've dealt this for, I de- I've dealt with this for, you know, years and years and years. Why would I change my mind now when it happened so, so far, you know, so far or long ago? It's like, no, no, mm-hmm. it ends now. 
right? Now's mm-hmm. the time. Just because you've dealt with this for like five years, 10 years, 15 years, wh- however many years, it's like, I, yeah. I love myself. So I'm going to allow myself to change my mind that I'm going exactly. to this. I'm going to make a change, you know? And you don't have to explain it, mm-hmm. you know, to anyone. Yeah. If you change your mind about anything. Yeah. I tell people all the time, no is a complete sentence. <laughs> yes. Oh, I love that. <laughs> I love that. I don't, I don't have to explain. It's just no. Yeah. We we no, feel like we have to explain everything away to have everybody mm-hmm. validate everything. And it's so not the case. No is a complete sentence. That is amazing. Yes. So. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I, I no longer feel the need to seek external validation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because yeah. I'm content with who I am yeah. and I'm comfortable in the skin that I'm in, even with all of my faults and idiosyncrasies, because we all have them. Yeah. We you find know, the people who are for you, it. you know, and yeah. because you are truly you, you know, mm-hmm. when you are truly you, you will find and attract people who are truly for you. Right. Mm-hmm. But if you're walking around as somebody who you're presenting to be and um, who you think you should be or hiding who you truly are, you're never going to find people who are truly for you. You know, which so, is why we connected. Yes, exactly. Instant connection, right. literally instant, instantly. And I, I'm so like grateful we went for all that. The way to LA because we were destined to meet. I know, right? From Texas and Florida all the way to LA, and then we come back up for here, and then we right. reconnected. And you helped me, um, you know, the other day when I um, I texted you. I was like, I don't know why, but I think Michelle will know this answer. Like, I think she can help me. And then you were so nice, and we got to talking. It's like, oh my gosh, this is perfect. It's like, um, come on the show. So I'm so yeah. so grateful that you said yes, and um, thank you for being strong by being vulnerable. You know, that's the strongest thing that you can do, and you're helping so many people do that and and you're leading by example where you're showing hey being vulnerable it it allows me to feel strong it gives me my voice back and guess what you're helping other people do the same thing too so thank you for your work um if if i mean and i know you're going to speak to so many people through this podcast how can how can we find you what what you know what are you, is it instagram or website or what do you offer you know tell us uh, everything so in a nutshell how you can find me all of my social media handles which is twitter facebook um youtube mm-hmm. and instagram is michelle speaks with a z m-i-c-h-e-l-l-e-s-p-e-a-k-z cool and i'll tag it in the bio too so check right. it there <laughs> right and my website is michelle speaks with a z.com and so you know, I'm a speaker um, and my, you know, I, I talk about resiliency and overcoming pain and healing from the inside out. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm an author. I'm a life coach, life recovery coach. And so, um, you know, I have a lot of programs that are online. We actually have one that's coming up November 2nd. So Perfect. if you guys are ready to begin your journey to healing, um, our Moving Beyond Pain begins November 2nd. Yes. And it's on the website. And, you know, I'm sure um, Meg can... You can find me if you mm-hmm. want to be a part of that. So, but that is my passion. That's what I, I love to do. I live to do, but I also make time for self-care. So, you know, imparting thoughts that if there was anything that you take away of nothing else, know that you have to set aside time to nurture yourself mm-hmm. um, before you nurture anybody else. And it must be a daily thing. Yes. How you start your day sets the tone of the day. And and not feeling selfish, yeah. You know, yeah. and I know yeah. you are on this self part of your self care routine is going to the gym yeah. and working out. And tell me about this um, Guinness Book of World Records situation here because right, y'all didn't right. know it, but we are with a star here. <laughs> <laughs> no, it takes a star to recognize them. Oh, hey. Um, I'll take that. <laughs> right. So. The Guinness Book of World Records is pending, and I want to share some tips to set the tone of your day, and then I'll tell you about that. Yeah. So you should spend on average every morning, your morning routine for of self-care should be about two hours. And if you don't have that time, then one hour. Um, and that's, you know, no notifications, put your mm. phone on silent. Yep. Um, you know, I started my day drinking warm water um, with lemon because that helps with digestion and you know everything is connected mind body spirit and yeah. so um write down a list of grat- things that you're grateful for um starting out with gratitude yeah make time to meditate with whatever that means to you read you know read the word pray 
and then sit and listen for at least 10 minutes after you've read and just listen for the download. Mm -hmm. Um, Make your bed, you know, something as simple as that. You know, if you have live in a cluttered environment, that's that's only an external um, manifestation of what's going on internal. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Your space clear. Um, And then exercise, even if you do nothing but stretch, stretching is the fountain of youth. It helps us to process and eliminate things in our body. Yeah. Not just physically, but spiritually. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, so move every day. Yeah. And then make sure that you eat something that's nourishing. Don't eat because it's comforting to you. Eat because it's nourishing to you. Because we're just like a car. We need fuel. Yeah. And good fuel. Yeah. To run effectively. And so... Those quick tips, if you take nothing else away, do that every day. Yes. And if you have to get up before the rest of the house does for those busy moms or dads or whatever, then do that. It'll because be worth how it. you begin your day, mm-hmm. how you begin your day is how the rest of the day is going to go. Yeah. You need that quiet time. So the Guinness book. So in August, um, right before I met you in September, um, I did a 24-hour maxi climber challenge. You know, the Versa climber. Like yep. a vertical. You know, I teach that, right? Or used to. I was, no, I didn't. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've actually I didn't. I've trained a lot of Houston on how to teach it too. Um, yeah, it's fun, but yeah. man, is that hard! I don't do it anymore, but it is difficult. If you've never it done is. it before, find a Versa Climber studio near you, try it, and then tw- twenty four hours. I don't even want to be on that thing for thirty minutes. It's like it's so hard. Hours, nonstop. You know, I took like a five to ten minute break at. You know, prior to the top of the hour, every hour, just for my team, because yeah. the key word, I had a team. I didn't do it alone. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that they could make sure I was hydrated, stretch me out and get me right back on. Wow. And so I say all that to say it doesn't matter what obstacles you have, because I had some physical barriers. You know, I had this. This was after my knee being reconstructed with a series of surgeries um, the previous year. And. I had a torn meniscus while I was doing it and I had surgery right after to repair it. My goodness. So the body will do whatever the mind says it can can or cannot do. So if you believe it in your mind, then you can achieve it um, in your whatever it is that you're endeavoring to do. And so, you know, three auto accidents that I should not have walked away from, um, you know, a reconstructed knee, but I still did it. But it was because I was doing it for something serve and do something beyond you, something greater than yourself, because it was to honor an organization here locally in Jacksonville that is meeting the unmet needs of our women veterans Mm -hmm. that are battling with military sexual trauma, which is part of my history. Yeah. So it was to raise uh, proceeds for them and we did it. 24 hours. Congratulations. That's amazing. Thank you. Thank you. That's honestly something to be very proud of. So Keep me tuned with uh, the the Guinness Book of I'll World let you Records. Know yes, I know. I know. I, if you want to check out the video, just go to my website. It's on the home page. Yes, you sent it to me, and I was like, "Oh my gosh, <laughs> you weren't kidding!" Yeah. <laughs> so, and if I can do it at fifty one, you guys can do it. I yeah. Mean, Age is nothing but a number. Oh my gosh, yes. And wait until you, you see the video of this. If you if you are listening on Spotify, tune into my Instagram so you can see the, the video of this. Um, you just, I don't believe it. I just don't believe you're 51. I just, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> There's just no way. But so you know where to find her um, The and the amazing work uh, that that she does. And, and you know, if, if this is a, a personal journey for you, if you know somebody who might benefit from this, um, send them this podcast because, you know, um, Michelle has clearly stated her mission is to help people. You know, we that's we we want to help people as and as many as they can. So share this podcast, please. Um, you know, Michelle and I both believe that you can create your life, you can create your fate. And Michelle, if you would be um, so uh, amazing to repeat this with me, I'm going to walk you through how I end my show every time, um, okay. where we say together, expect good things always and they will happen so if you feel aligned with that energy we will say it together okay ready i'll give us a a countdown so a three two one expect Expect good things things. always Always. and they will happen happen. yes thank you and thank you so much for being on the show um and for just again being so open and transparent and authentic um i really appreciate that and i know um my listeners will too so Thank you. And um, we'll be talking to you soon.
All right. Thank you so much, Meg. And you are phenomenal. Keep doing what you're doing. The world needs you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we will talk to y'all later and have an amazing day. It's time for you to create your fate.